And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of Hell, creator of Hell Knight, Sigil, Warpland, <laughs> and men and many other projects. <laughs> and now coming back with a spin-off of sorts to Hell Knight with known as the Black Rainbow Society. The one and only Gabriel Quiroga, who is currently not tormenting me with barbecue pictures. <laughs> How are you doing today? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mildra, for the invitation, as always. Very honored to be in the monastery with you. Mm -hmm. I am not drinking beer right now, but I'm drinking a glass of wine to make uh, some honor to your practices. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, I suppose I'll, I suppose I'll start at the, be the beginning. When it comes... I remember you talking about about building this particular uh, project, but was this something that you had conceived of while Hell Knight was while you were writing Hell Knight, or was this something that the idea came afterwards? Uh, the idea came definitely afterwards. Uh, I was really trying to uh, tackle. Uh, my burnout by reading something different. So I started reading William Burroughs mm -hmm. and this uh, uh, gave me the idea to, to do the Black Rainbow Society. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I'm no stranger to William Burroughs, but since some of the audience might be, what exactly about his writing per served as the inspiration for Black Rainbow Society? So I think that... Uh, he has a lot of, uh, he touches a lot of issues regarding conspiracies that are very interesting. And at the same time, he deals with astral phenomena. And it, there is always like a sense that there is a, another reality overlapping ours. And I thought that that was really interesting. There are a lot of deities or spiritual beings that enter communi communion with the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that a lot. Uh, as I said, there is a lot, of, a lot of information regarding the history of secret societies and also because I think that he was involved in the CIA uh, briefly, or at least his family was, so he knew a lot of, of, of all that world of espionage and that uh, kind of thing that's also very interesting. And a bit of psychic phenomena also. Uh, and besides all that, I, was, I really appreciated the creative technique of cut up. Mm -hmm. I thought that it would be really cool to try to make a setting out of that technique. So I started working with the cut up technique and I ended up developing an idea that I call astral radio. So for me, it's like a, a radio that's on the astral realm that all the characters can uh, tune into that. And there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of information and a lot of misinformation, um, so it will be like a chapter for in the in, in the book, the Astral Radio, mm -hmm. and you can use that for the adventure or to become inspired as a master, or just to have fun trying to figure out what they are saying, what the voices are saying, because there are multiple voices, and there is a lot of visual imagery in contrast or. Uh, playing with those voices, uh, so it's a very interesting. It, it tries to uh, portray the idea of uh, of characters having uh, their third eye open, and in some way being connected to that collective unconsciousness. You know, as, as Carl Jung said. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with that, and it's also like a melting pot of pop '80s pop culture and metal. Uh, mental culture that's also very very interesting so the whole book will be like a visual tour de force of that era yeah and when we're, when we're talking when we're talking about um, 80s metal culture I'd, I suppose that would be especially if we're dealing with early 80s that would be right between that dividing line between hard, between hard rock and metal 
along with yes. uh, along with the rise of more prog styles. Um, some of yeah, this I, has I, been carried over into like, stoner doom and the like these days. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that there are so many subgenres. Uh, at the beginnings, I tried to concentrate on or maybe doing more classic metal or whatever, mm -hmm. but it ended up being super diverse and it also touches uh, a lot of punk. Uh, I am a big fan of the No Wave uh, New York scene, so that also comes up. Uh, it can it can get very cheesy, it can get almost Bon Jovi at, at, at moments, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or worse, but uh, it's uh, it touches a bit of every subgenre. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It also, also Sabbath. But I wanted to deviate a bit from uh, Hell Knight, which was strictly more uh, doom metal oriented. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a difference. This vibe. is a bit more psycho. This is a bit much more lysergic and more psychedelic. Yeah, that's that's why I brought up um, Stoner Doom. That's that and mm -hmm. Funeral Doom are much different affairs than doom metal. Uh huh. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, funeral doom is much is much more atmospheric, much more slower paced. This is where you get stuff like sun. Um, claro, yes, and yes. Sto and stoner doom is not far removed from from like late seventies um, hard rock or progressive. Um, this yeah. is where you, mm -hmm. Some examples, of course, would be stuff like the sword, um, electric wizard. Um, Stoner uh -huh. train. Caius was one of the mm. first, no? Stoner Doom bands. Yeah, though it's whenever it comes to the first of a given. Yeah, I know it was right? a it's, movement. It's it yeah. It's hard to. It's hard to say. It's hard to say which one. Mm -hmm. Um. No, no. If, if I have to be fair, I would say that Black Sabbath yeah. uh, started Doom for me at least. Yeah. So. It, Whenever, whenever it comes to discerning the first of a given genre, it's ne it's never a simple affair, in my opinion, because it's it's always a, it's not like one person came about and then boom, a new genre was made. It's always a gradual. Absolutely, process. absolutely. Well, we can see that in RPGs when we see a movement, and it's very difficult to pinpoint who was the one that started it. It's all more like a movement, and every artist is affecting each other and inspiring each other to do the same. But I, I saw a, I saw a Pink Floyd concert uh, yesterday, and I was surprised that it sounded super doom metal, and it was in the seventies. Yeah, well. Since you brought up Pink Floyd, I, have you ever have you ever done the Dark Side of the Rainbow experiment? Uh, that's the one with uh, Alicia. Oh uh, no! What you no. what you do is you t is take it take a copy of the Wizard of Oz. As soon as the ah, with the Wizard the of Oz. Time, yes, you play the start of um, Dark Side of the Moon, like the full album. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah, yeah, and it's all in sync. Yeah. In in sync by accident, because mm -hmm. that's one that's been one of those things that's been around for years. Um, I think somebody asked the the band if that was intentional, and they they had said no. So it's one it's one of those coincidences that just happens to work. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it, I think that I used to I used to play music and. And and shoot uh, and project videos on VHS uh, on some venues, mm -hmm. and it always happened that they asked me if the music was in sync with the video. Uh, it's it's fairly easy for the video to sort of uh, get in sync with the music if it's not extremely. Uh, I don't know. May maybe the music is too passive aggressive, and then it has it has to be. It's a bit more difficult because the the theme of the imagery has to be in sync with the, with the music, but if the music is more or less uh, equalized or more or less hom homo homogeneous, uh, it kind of works, or, or the mind makes it work. Yeah, it's it's one of it's one of those is the is the flag mo is the flag moving or is the wind moving kind of things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now. You've described the book as a hybrid between a, between a um, between a game book and an art book. 
Mm -hmm. um, what exactly do you mean? What exactly do you mean by that kind of thing? And what prompted the idea? Well, I think that oh, my, my own perception of what uh, some books are, and and also the feedback I get from the people that consume my books is that uh, many many buy them and maybe they spend uh, weeks just uh, uh, looking at the pages and swooping at the pages and just uh, delving into it without much uh, order. Um, so I, I think that that's also even a part of the experience when you buy a book that has a lot of art or has a theme. And maybe, maybe in fact, that was also the way that you could uh, read some of the writings from William Burroughs. Uh, maybe it, it doesn't seem that it has any order at all for uh, some chapters. You can read them uh, a bit in, many, in, in any order. So uh, I think that that was very interesting. So I thought that this was, okay, this is then part, uh, one of the... Uh, of the possibilities of the experience uh, you can have with a book. Mm -hmm. The other experience is just uh, reading it whole and absorbing all the content and all the visual imagery and all the and all the lore, which is very it is quite complex, and that can take you uh, maybe two weeks or so. And there is a lot of content on the book, and mm -hmm. so that would be the second part to me of, of the way you can experience uh, this type of books. And the third part is the game book part, uh, actually playing uh, the session and actually playing the game, which is a lot of effort in itself. Um, uh, I know that uh, some people, they don't even care about that third experience, to be honest. For me, it is fundamental, but uh, I would not emphasize that it is fundamental for anyone to play the book. I think that it will be super interesting and it will be very rewarding for them. But mm -hmm. uh, the other experiences are also as good as good as, as this one. Yeah, I can get that. So yeah, the pre the premises as I under as I understand it is dealing with a bunch of a bunch of psychonauts who end who end up um, getting getting a little bit in over their head. Um, mm -hmm. Which, in a roundabout way, the the wrong guys at the at the wrong place fe feels like a um. It gives me a it gives me a bit a bit of a Coen Brothers vibe. I'm not sure if that was intent if that was intentional <laughs> or not. No, yeah, it, it could be, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, uh, the premise the premise was very important for me because I wanted to. I always like to start the games with an idea that gives you cohesion in the party. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like the idea that uh, every character is on, on their own. I, I want to set up a team. So you start the book, you know that this is a team. They belong to guys that have their sort of related philosophical ideas. They are a bit against the system. They are a bit anarchic. And suddenly they have their third, third eye open and they have weird psychic powers and they start realizing that uh, behind the scenes there are a lot of entities demons or creatures from other or other dimensions that they are uh, sort of controlling humanity and seeking to control the world mm -hmm. so the guys uh, decide that they need to fight against that but they are also in peril because these entities realize that this group exists and they have a uh, a uh, decent measure of power. Uh, so I think that that was very interesting. I'm a very big fan of uh, Delta Green mm -hmm. and and Colt. So I think I think okay, okay, how can I mix both of them, Colt and Delta Green, and and maybe within the Hellnet setting, how can I make it uh, with sense, now with coherence? Um, and I think that this this works. This really works. Well, we have been playing. We played yesterday. The campaign is almost seven months long now. So there is a lot to do. There is uh, a lot of uh, stuff going on, and uh, it's uh, it feels different from Hellnet. It has uh, a bit of the vibe, but um, it is a a worthwhile experience because I think that it's. A standalone, but also a spin-off from the Hellline series. Uh, using the same system, it's a very, 
eh, very worthwhile as its own eh, idea. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now, within within that, when it comes to adversaries, because of the the more psychedelic leaning that th that this book is going for, um, I'm get I'm guessing that was a, me a means to go out in terms of the sort of environments that a party might see, or the sort of, for lack of a better term, monsters that they may encounter, I guess, um, mm -hmm. adversaries, if you want something a little more broad. Mm -hmm. hey, what, what, what are they? What are the opponents, um, the adversaries? Well, I'm, I'm curious, I'm just curious, I'm just curious if, if, um, you had gone wild when it came, when it came to what a party might encounter with this, with this, mm -hmm. with this, um, setup. Yeah, uh, well, there are many, there are many like organizations, uh, shady, powerful organizations that they can encounter besides uh, besides what Hell Knight brings, that is uh, the classical mm -hmm. vampire, werewolves, uh, demons, uh, uh, raids, uh, zombies, or whatever in the classical horror, old eighties uh, mm -hmm. cinema or literature. You have all that. But in the Black Rainbow Society, you have a lot of uh, organizations like, I, I don't want to uh, give you a list of all of them, but for example, you have like a family of cannibal doppelgangers uh, whose main trade is information. And these guys basically consume uh, the top players in politics and replace them with their own members. And these are called the Blavatsky. Uh, that's a very, very interesting adversary. You also have like a race of parasitic uh, centipedes that uh, seek to infect our reality and, our, our, and use people as hosts. This is a big reference to William Burroughs that he always uh, talks about centipedes and all the insects going around. So centipedes are a big thing because uh, there are infinite number of sub races of centipedes. So uh, they keep... Uh, showing up in different ways, in different forms, with different powers and different sizes and qualities. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I and you see, also... Oh, I did see that sorry. you have several factions that, you're, that you are um, working with. Ye uh, several factions uh, uh, of opponents, you mean? Adversaries. Yeah. Yeah, I, sp I suppose. Though, when it comes to some of the other factions, like the fu the funerals, the nameless, and the like, um, mm -hmm. do you have? Is it a is it a case where not o not only could they potentially be um, on one side or the mm -hmm. other when it comes to how they see the party, but they don't. But the factions don't always see eye to eye with each other. Of course, yeah, yeah, they are they are not uh, allies between themselves. Uh, they, they have their own agenda, and sometimes uh, that agenda can go in line with some of the missions of the Black Rainbow Society. So you can get, you can end up uh, working with some of them or having an understanding with some of them. That that's what's actually happening in the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we have a. Um, we have also that sect that worships Oblivion that for me are one of the most interesting guys. The nameless, these guys, um, as I said, worship nothingness because uh, there is like a sort of primordial entity made of, uh, that lives on the abyss, on, on the bottom of the abyss and feeds from Oblivion itself and grants access to whatever it is on Oblivion to its followers. So all their followers want to destroy everything there is, so they are the only ones with access to that knowledge. Um, uh, they are the ones behind the great, the great destructions of history uh, in mankind. For example, the burning of the Library of Alexandria, or you know, many, many destructions of cities where knowledge was lost. Mm -hmm. I, can I can certainly get that. Now, so those are the big, big, uh, big bad guys. Yeah, uh, the Black Rainbow is against. Mm -hmm. Besides uh, all the Hell Knight guys, besides demons, and besides all that, that they can also show up. Oh yeah. Now, 
I did notice that you do have a, you do have a handful of tables. One of the big ones I wanted to get into is what exactly is rubber reality? Rubber reality. Well, rubber reality is a subgenre of ho uh, within horror uh, that uh, came up. Uh, I think that it was um, the director of, uh, behind Hellraiser was or not? Mm, I don't know which one, which one. Well, the name of the director that that uh, created the genre. But anyway, rubber reality uh, is about a nightmare of on Helm Street. Uh, de depending on the mechanic, you can roll on the real reality table to to suddenly for something real weird to come up. There are uh, d20 tables, um, and there are a lot of mechanics that sort of, for example, the, the, there is a power that allows you to do meta gaming, so the character can actually know whatever the player knows, and he does not need to explain how he knows it. I think I thought that that was a very interesting power. Uh, that sort of uh, that sort of strange weirdness that I, I thought that was very interesting and very funny to uh, to play with. The the director behind was Wes Craven. Wes Craven, the the one that coined the term rabbit reality. Yeah, Fil films that deal with the way that reality can be distorted and permeated, going into dream states and state of madness and all sorts of strange illusions. So there are many films of that genre uh, in the eighties, and I want to grab them all. A big film uh, of that genre is uh, Into the Mouth of Madness. Mm -hmm. That I'm a super big fan of that. That has a lot of Lovecraft uh, uh, things also. That that's also uh, uh, a lot of. Um, a lot of the issues you may encounter with uh, in Black Rainbow Society have to do with primordials and also uh, with the awakening of prim uh, primordial gods. That can also happen. Yeah. But I did not. I did not want to emphasize that because I thought that that was an area that Delta Green touched too too good or, or too uh, much better than, than me. So I did not want to mingle in those waters. Mm -hmm. Um. Since you brought up one film from the Apocalypse trilogy, have you seen the f the second film, um, Heart of Dar um, Prince of Darkness, the one, the one that's kind yes. of the redhead? It's kind of the redheaded stepchild of the three, but it does have some interesting motifs. And I I guess you, I guess I kind of answered my own question since in the playlist you set up for the Black Rainbow Society, the first song song on that is the This Is a <laughs> Dream seg segment from that movie. Exactly, yes, yes. It's exactly that. It's exactly the vibe we are aiming at uh, with Black Rainbow. Mm -hmm. The way that they they sort of send a message from the future to contact humanity and how time overlaps and distorts and also space overlaps and distorts. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can get really uh, metaphysical and I wanted to, to play that, to play into those waters. Uh, that's, the, that's what we are aiming at. Um, and also, bes besides um, rubber reality, we have also reality bends, uh, tables. There are a lot of uh, similar terms to to name uh, tables that actually distort uh, the story, the storyline, and distort the perception that players have of what is going on. Yeah, and it's. <clears throat> I think what makes that an effective tool in horror is. That fe that fear of loss of control that's a very primal thing, and it's even more so when you're when um you're not exactly sure how much of your own senses you can trust. The th the thing yes. that is crucial to you interacting with the world around you. Um, I am uh, yeah I absolutely I abs you are absolutely out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. so it's uh, absolutely unnerving. To me, that's the reason why Alice in Wonderland it was uh, almost like a horror story. For me, I watched Alice in Wonderland, it was always like, oh, that scares well, the shit out of me. Well, <laughs> the, nothing makes if, sense. Well, of, of course, if you want to if you want to see the Alice go full horror, there's two there's two options. Um, one is the American McGee games. 
which uh -huh. don't e don't even try to don't even try when it comes to when it comes to whether or not it's going to avoid the horror. Um, the other option is the Czech version of the of the story, which is ah, somewhat yes. of a nod to to puppet theater in Czech in in Czechoslovakia. Um, yeah, what was the name of the director? Um, I don't rem I don't remember. I just remember that the film was just called Alice, and it is yes weird. <laughs> it's all stop motion, all made with stop motion. I love it. A it's a lot of uh, it's. It's a lot of stop motion and a lot of puppet work. Since, as I mentioned, puppet mm -hmm. theater is a big thing in that part the, of Europe. The the name of the guy is uh, I w I am sure I am mispronouncing it, but it's Zvang Meyer. Look, it's Eastern European. It's Eastern European yeah. um, names. You're, we're gonna mispronounce. <laughs> Very it. different. I'm doing my best, but I'm a fan of the guy. I actually own the of official DVD with all his works. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I like that uh, a lot. It's, it it gets very weird. Also, I also I think that David Lynch touches that uh, very well, formidably. Uh, so uh, there are some Lynch uh, troops you can find in the in the book as well. Yeah. Also, I I had to ch I had to check because there's multiple films named Alice, so I I ended up getting the wrong one. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the. The version that I'm the version that I'm familiar with was that was done by John Swankmajer. Again, I know yes. I screwed it up, but that came yeah, out in um, that came that came out in 1988. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, wonderful. I love it, mm -hmm. and it's quite long. Eh? It was uh, it lot of stuff going on. It's a lot of work. It's definitely an endurance test because because there's barely any scoring uh-huh oh. yeah and no dialogue dialogue no dialogue there's almost zero there is dialogue. there's some dialogue but it's very but it's very it's very minimal it does make me mm -hmm. wonder how how small of a budget they actually had mm -hmm. yeah it reminds me uh, also uh, to mad god from uh, philip uh, tippet oh yeah that one <laughs> <laughs> that that thing that took ten years to make and is absolutely horrifying in the best and worst <laughs> way possible. That's that movie is crazy. <laughs> it is, um, and I've something something that I've off that I've um that I've always that I've wanted to explore, and I think Black Rainbow Society can lean into this, is the idea of the fantastical never truly going away, always being that always being there. It may be because I'm a child of the '90s and the, and those modern Gothic, modern mythos um, shows, books, and the like were all over the place growing up. Mm -hmm. you know, where the, where the where the the old myths, the old su the old supernatural things are still are never really went away. They're still pr they're still present. They just changed how they approach things as the world changed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, um, they they did some um, the the Neil Gaiman, I think, that did something similar with American Gods, right? Yeah, that's he did with both American Gods and one could argue the majority of the of the stories he did with the Endless, especially um, especially uh -huh. Sandman, and even more especially mm -hmm. um, Death. Yes, yes, he he took that and perfected. Oh. And I'd also be remiss if I if I didn't bring up the the my love my love for the crow, which is kind, ah, of, kind yes. of in that same kind of in that same vein because that is a that that is that for a lot of people that was part of their gothic starter pack, and yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, the but the in in line in line with all the vampire theme, no right? Yeah, though. Obvious, obviously, there was a lot of there was a lot of the vampire element in, in the '90s, but I, f I feel like focusing just on that would be doing that neo gothic scene a bit of a disservice. Um, mm -hmm. And I know I know that some aspects of it came from the club scene in like Amsterdam, but yeah, the hmm. but the central idea of the of the fantastical still existing in some form in the modern world is something. 
that something worth exploring. And I think it, I think it can be because because of the fact that reality is malleable. You could eat. You could easily have it that there are hidden that there are hidden places where the way where the way things work isn't exactly the same. Oh. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I, um, going back uh, to that movie into the mouth of madness, I think that well, one of the premises is exactly that that uh, there are so many people reading a book that reality itself starts to distort and change uh, in tune with that book. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, a very interesting concept. There was also there's there's also the concept of belief that um, Pratchett had with his Discworld books, where gods treat belief quite literally as food. <laughs> The more belief, the more belief they have, the more that they grow. The less that they have, the more that they go into decline and can fade out. Uh, but cool. there's also the concept of old gods do new jobs, Bas which is how, oh, say, the uh, boogeyman become becomes a guardian of children instead of a thing instead of a thing that frightens people. Yes, yes. Well, something similar happens to. Um, Ishtar uh, in American Gods. She becomes like uh, something like the Easter goddess or related to the bunny rabbit or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's, it's they, a similar concept. It, mm -hmm. it transforms into something else and people uh, keep worshipping it without knowing exactly what it is uh, the background mm -hmm. of, of, of what they are worshipping. Oh yeah. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a page count for the Black Rainbow Society? I'm not sure, but I think that, I, for example, with Hell Knight, we started aiming at 70 pages and it ended up being 155. <laughs> so it can change a lot, but at the, at the moment I am aiming at a very comfortable 66 pages of uh, pure visual roller coaster. Mm -hmm. I so th there won't there won't be any page with, with that will will be just text. It will always be a pure image within the text. I am handling text as if it was image itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could. I can. De I can definitely see that. But with with that and keep. And um, to follow up on that, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Um, at, le at least for the PDF um, version. Like, um... Well, well the, the good thing is that I have about 50% of the work uh, done uh, regarding layout and pages. So I have about 35 pages done. So I guess that the book should be finished in two months. Uh, and then we take it to the printer. So, yeah, three months top. I think that uh, we can have it delivered. All right, and I'll certainly be looking forward to it. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple once again. Uh, thank you for the invitation, as always, Mildra. It is a pleasure. I love uh, talking with you regarding all these uh, very uh, geek subjects we love, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and it's all it's always a pleasure, man. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Salute. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>